Today's video is sponsored by Keeps, but more on that in just a moment. With nearly 10 million inhabitants and nearly 200,000 square kilometers, or some 77,000 square miles, today's protagonist is a country that has recently stood out for three main reasons. First, for being considered no less than the last dictatorship in Europe. Second, for having played and continuing to play a key role in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And thirdly, in exactly the same vein, for being the only European ally left to Vladimir Putin's Russia. Of course, we are talking about Alexander Lukashenko's Belarus. Never before had this country played such a prominent role. Remember that this was the country where the Wagner agreed to take refuge after mutinying and marching on Moscow. Also, it is the place where the very invasion of Ukraine actually began on the 24th of February 2022. Don't forget that the first Russian offensive started from the Belarusian region of Homil. And that was not all. At the same time, in parallel with the advance of ground troops, the Russian Air Force launched dozens of attacks against Ukrainian targets with aircraft and missiles that took off and were launched from Belarus. Despite Lukashenko's historic promises that Ukraine would never be attacked from his country, the Russian plans to take over Kyiv in 72 hours had Belarus playing an absolutely key role. Those who reproach us, didn't you know that we have the closest alliance with the Russian Federation? With them, we are building a single, powerful, independent state the Union State. We have been and will be together with Fraternal Russia. Our participation in the special operation was decided by me a long time ago. Since then, this has been by far the country most affected by international sanctions, both economically and politically. Some of this country's best-known companies have even decided to leave the country. Take Wargaming, for example, the developer of well-known games such as this one. Polaris's biggest games company is leaving the country and Russia. World of Tanks developer War gaming to close studios and transfer operation of games. But do you know what? None of this is even the worst of it. The worst thing is that a long time after the war started, it is no longer Ukraine's sovereignty that is at risk, but that of Belarus itself. Yet, yeah? You heard me right. This country could disappear in the not too distant future and not precisely by being invaded by Ukraine or NATO. Belarus runs the risk of being annexed by the great Russian bear. Without going any further, the Ukrainian parliament itself considers that Russia has de facto already occupied it. This is practically the same position held by the Belarusian opposition in exile. And this has caused all of us here at Visual Politic to ask a few key questions. To what extent is Belarus at risk of being annexed by Russia? What is behind Moscow's alleged intentions? Why does Lukashenko seem to be doing nothing about it? Well, in this video, we're going to answer these and a bunch of other questions. But before we get started, believe it or not, hair loss is a problem that affects over 60% of men. While there isn't a magic cure for baldness, it's possible to prevent hair loss from worsening. Keeps offers an online subscription service allowing you to customize an FDA-approved solution based on your specific stage of hair loss. Once your treatment plan is in place, your products are discreetly shipped in non-branded packaging. Choose shipment intervals of every 3, 6 or 12 months based on what suits you best. Unfortunately, it is a bit late for me. Keeps can only stop hair loss, it cannot regenerate hair. So it's best to take action in the early stages of hair loss. Most Keeps users observe noticeable results within 6 months of starting their treatment. But don't just take our word for it. Head to their website and check out the reviews for before and after photos of real men who've had success with this program. So, if this is a problem that is bothering you or someone that you care about and you have a US address, remember, hair loss stops with Keeps. For special offer, to get started, go to keeps.com forward slash visual politic or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash visual politic. And now, let's get cracking. Basically, visual politic viewers, Belarus has one major problem. From Moscow's perspective, this is not really a foreign country, nor a fully independent one. Instead, they see it as a kind of autonomous territory that somehow really actually belongs to Mother Russia itself. And of course, as you can imagine, knowing all the background, this is extremely disturbing. But the worst thing is that this is not an exclusively Russian perspective. 
When Lukashenko came to power in 1994, he did so by winning an election in which his campaign was based above all on integration with Russia, particularly in the economic sphere, but not only there. Let's say that at the time, Lukashenko received political and economic support from Moscow in exchange for reinforcing the Russian worldview. In fact, the Belarusian identity, which for years has been promoted and continues to be promoted by the regime, is based above all on the cult of the Soviet past, on the Great Patriotic War, that's the Second World War to all the rest of us, and brotherhood with Russia. About the rest of Belarus's past, not a whisper. Lukashenko himself has even said on state television that Belarusians, in essence, are Russians with a quality seal. Yep. I kid you not. In fact, it was to a large extent this position that explains why, in 1999, Moscow and Minsk signed a bilateral treaty to progressively constitute the so-called Union State. In other words, the two countries decided to merge. Well, not merge exactly, but to strengthen to the extreme their social, political and economic integration with joint institutions. We are talking, for example, about a common currency and a unified tax code. For now, it's not gone that far, but from the very beginning, freedom of movement between the two countries and the unification of the two labor markets were established. And so, Russians and Belarusians do not need permits or any other particular documents to work in either country. But all in all, the question we have to ask is, why did Belarus decide to take this important step? So let's see. Apparently, it had everything to lose. I mean, right? A small country associating with a much larger one, it's kind of clear that Moscow would end up making all the decisions, isn't it? Well, actually, no. Or at least that's not what Lukashenko thought. Check this out. The 1990s were very hard for Russia. The country was in a constant crisis and this awakened the ambition of the Belarusian leader. As we have already told you on several occasions before here on Visual Politic, Lukashenko came to think that in many joint bodies the weight of power of Russia and Belarus would be exactly the same. He even went so far as to think that he himself could lead this kind of supra-state. Obviously, the passage of time made things look completely different, to the point that these days we are not talking about a partnership for Belarus, but about the real risk of annexation by Russia. And the question is, was Lukashenko so naive? How could Europe's last dictator be a guy who is so easily played? Well, the truth is, but this is not actually quite the case. The Belarusian dictator always had one eye on Russia and one eye on the West, until one day, all of that changed. So what happened to make Minsk practically surrender to Moscow? Well, let's find out. The Calculated Ambiguity Shortly after the signing of the State of the Union Treaty, the commodity and oil super cycle began, which consolidated Putin's first period at the helm of Russia. During those years, dollars started flowing into Russia like there was no tomorrow, and of course, Belarus benefited from that sudden wave of prosperity. Its exports to the Russian giant skyrocketed. Many young people moved to the neighboring country to work, and naturally, direct investment by Russian companies in the country multiplied. These were the golden years of Lukashenko's Belarus. But, as the saying goes, all that glitters is not gold. There is a problem, a big problem that kept the Belarusian dictator awake at night. Soon after Putin came to power, Lukashenko understood perfectly well that the new Russian leader was not like Yeltsin and that, therefore, his plans to pilot the joint state they had agreed to create were doomed to absolute failure. <laughs> As a result, they started dragging their feet on the project in Minsk. And not only that, when oil prices deflated, the Belarusian government took the opportunity to stop looking directly to Moscow and to start paying more attention to the West. The target was the giant European Union market. And that's not even all. It also began to cultivate a national identity of its own, one that went beyond Russia. For example, in 2014, several Russian media outlets began to blame the Belarusian leader for flirting with nationalism and trying to supplant Russian culture. There is an undeclared Russia-phobic campaign in Belarus and nationalist forces are being openly pandered to. The government slyly took all sorts of measures, some as symbolic as replacing St. George ribbons, which were widely used 
his celebrations with green-red ribbons imitating the colours of the official flag. Also, in 2018, the regime went so far as to allow, some say even encourage, public celebrations for the 100th anniversary of the Belarusian Republic that was declared in 1918 after temporarily succeeding from Russia. This had been the first attempt at national independence in its modern history, and as you can imagine, it's a symbol for nationalist movements. But these are just two examples of a movement that clearly sought to reinforce a true national identity for the first time. Not surprisingly, by that time, the Belarusian regime had already become much more cautious about Putin's new Russia. They did not trust it. They knew that if they did not consolidate a clear national identity and start looking for commercial and economic alternatives, the country would sooner or later be swallowed up by Russia. They were even willing to give up certain subsidies in exchange for more economic and political independence. At that time, beyond appearances, the truth is that relations between Minsk and Moscow were not exactly the best. In fact, in early 2020, Russia went so far as to cut off oil supplies to this country and re-established border controls on the movement of people. To give you an idea of how things stood, Lukashenko refused at all times to recognize the Russian annexation of Crimea. For him, Crimea was still Ukraine. And he also made statements like this one. Belarus would never allow other countries to use our territory for military intervention in Ukraine. The problem is that looking to the West is sometimes easier said than done, especially if you are a dictatorship with an iron fist and a terribly obsolete economy. In the case of Belarus, all that it could export to the European Union were basically commodities and low value added products, wood, metal, potatoes, and above all, petrochemical products. You see, Belarus has a huge installed capacity to produce fuels and oil derivatives. So what's the problem? That the whole industry, the largest in the country, basically depends on the supply of cheap Russian oil. And so, while it increased its exports to the West, it increased its dependence on Russia. It was not an easy situation, but in any case, the truth was that the distance between Moscow and Minsk was increasing and doing so quickly. You could say it was the great opportunity to take Belarus out of the Kremlin sphere of control once and for all. Nevertheless, visual politic viewers, in 2020, this whole process suddenly fell apart. And no, it was not because of what you were thinking. The crucial event in this whole story was not COVID-19, but the presidential elections. Check this out. On the 9th of August 2020, presidential elections were held. Lukashenko's candidacy officially won just over 80% of the vote. Of course, these elections were almost as rigged as a track and field race involving Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And the result sparked huge peaceful protests demanding a game change in the country. The protests were so large and had so much international support that for the first time, the Belarusian regime was kind of on the ropes. And that's not even all. To make matters worse, the Belarusians began to withdraw money en masse from the bank and tried by all means to convert their local rubles into stronger currencies, such as the dollar or the euro, in case anything should happen. Within a month, the Belarusians practically exhausted all the reserves of the central bank and institutions such as the IMF refused to come to their aid. The country was on the verge of collapse and Lukashenko's dictatorship seemed to be hanging by a thread. There was only one way out, to throw himself into Russia's arms. And guess what? No sooner said than done, that's exactly what he did. The Belarusian regime asked Vladimir Putin for help, and within days, Russia approved a first bailout of $1.5 billion. Then, along with that financial bailout, Russia also promised, you guessed it, military assistance. Vladimir Putin has offered to send military assistance to support Belarus. President Alexander Lukashenko has up to 200,000 protesters gathered to demand his removal. On top of that, the Kremlin also sent all kinds of propaganda and repression professionals. Without going any further, the television channels were practically taken over by Russian propagandists. Propagandists who were naturally under orders from Moscow and not Minsk. Be that as it may, the point is that with all this help and with the guarantee that the Russian army would prevent any kind of uprising against the Belarusian government, Lukashenko was able to increase the repression and persecution of all political opposition without fearing the consequences. In 2021, 
this even happened, remember? Ryanair confirms that Belarus has forced one of its planes to land. Exactly. The Belarusian Air Force forced a Ryanair plane flying between Athens and Vilnius to land in Minsk in order to arrest Roman Protasevich and his partner Sofia Sapega. Protasevich is a journalist and critical opposition activist with asylum in the European Union. Wait a minute. To force a European commercial airliner to land between two European cities, even sending a fighter jet to make it happen, and all of that to detain a person who has political asylum in Europe. Obviously, that meant crossing all of the red lines, but at that time in Minsk, thanks to Moscow's support, they could afford to do it. There was only one problem. Gifts are almost never free, and they certainly weren't in this case. In return for all this help, the Belarusian dictator had to grant the Kremlin far more influence than ever before. He even had to commit himself to pushing through a constitutional reform that would, for example, allow the permanent deployment of Russian troops in the country. Crazy. As you can imagine, this whole process was accompanied by a lot of new sanctions from the international community, which obviously further deepened the country's dependence on Russia. Let's just say that the era of looking to the West had come to an end for good, and that it was at this point that everything changed. For years, Belarus had strongly opposed the opening of Russian military bases in the country. They understood, logically, that this posed an intolerable threat. After the rescue of 2020, however, there was no choice but to give in to Russian demands. For example, in addition to growing military ties from 2020 onwards, strong anti-Western rhetoric was also launched by the Belarusian government. The State of the Union returned to the front page. In 2021, tens of thousands of migrants from the Middle East and Africa were used to cause a political and humanitarian crisis on the border with Poland and Lithuania. And in November of that same year, Minsk recognized Crimea as part of Russia for the first time time. What's more, an intensive Russification program was also launched in the country. Even sculptures of the rulers of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania were removed from the National Museum. From that point on, the past of Belarus could only, at least officially, pass through Russia. However, it is not only political factors, the ties with the rest of the world, and cultural identity issues that endanger the independence of Belarus. The truth is that this country is more and more intertwined with Russia. In fact, it's still difficult, very difficult, to say that it's still an independent country. Do you want to know exactly what we're talking about? Well then, check this out. A hostile takeover bit. Visual politic community. The Russian invasion of Ukraine made Belarus a pariah state and completely marginalized it on international markets. The international community applied practically the same sanctions as it did to Russia with one big difference. This country has no oil, gas, or nuclear technology to play with on the global geopolitical chessboard. In fact, Belarus has nothing to play with, and that explains why sanctions here have been much more devastating than in Russia itself. For example, in the first months of the war alone, Belarusian exports to the European Union plummeted by almost 60%. Some of the most thriving companies left the country, industry had to lay off more than 15% of its workers, wages in the sanctioned sectors plummeted, and the economy as a whole fell by an optimistic 5% in 2020. And of course, as we have already told you, all of this has made Belarus today much more dependent on motherland Russia than ever before. But now the question we have to ask is, how far does all this dependence really go? Well, the truth is that it's almost total. It is so extensive that one of the country's major sources of public revenue consists of reselling on the international market part of the oil it receives at subsidized prices from Russia. According to estimates, we are talking about a profit in 2022 of $1.7 billion from this operation alone. In 2023, it is expected to be almost $3 billion. Obviously, in Russia, they know about this operation. And guess what? Ultimately, they don't care. They are the ones in control of the crude oil tap. In fact, one of the country's main exports is fuels produced from Russian oil, something that for years was encouraged by Moscow. What better way to control a country if its main industry depends exclusively on you? And it's not even just the oil it resells or the fuel it exports. In total, more than two thirds of the energy the country consumes either comes from Russia or is controlled by Russian companies. In other words, in the current context, if Moscow were to turn off the tap, Belarus would practically go dark. But 
let's look beyond energy. About half of all the country's public debt is in Russian hands. Then, with foreign direct investment, it is a very similar story. And to top it off, many Russian state-owned companies control key assets in Belarus. We are talking about banks, telecommunications companies, and refineries. Even worse, it is estimated that today, 60 to 70% of all Belarusian exports go to the land of Vladimir Putin. In other words, from an economic point of view, we can no longer speak of a completely independent country. And all of this explains why, when Russia wanted to invade Ukraine and take Kyiv in three days, it used this country. Lukashenko could not oppose it. In fact, since the beginning of the invasion in Ukraine, the country has been one of the main bases for missile launches, has given the Russian armed forces a substantial part of its military arsenals, has allowed them intensive use of its railroads and roads, and has even become a key medical center for soldiers fallen or wounded at the front. But. Wait a minute, this is nothing new. So why do we say that there is now a real risk of annexation by Russia? Well, because Belarus may end up becoming a kind of consolation prize. Think about it. However the Ukrainian war ends, it is clear that the campaign has been and will be a resounding failure. And obviously, no tyrant likes to present himself as defeated. Putin promised to protect Russia and make it bigger, and that is no longer happening in Ukraine. For years, Belarus tried to juggle, to take advantage of the Russian bear without falling completely into its clutches. Now, that is no longer possible. Putin knows this and seems more than willing to take advantage of this situation. One way would be to force an annexation to Russia under the framework of the Union State or some other political intervention, such as the recreation of the satellite states of the former Soviet Union. In this way, he could sell the picture of a bigger and stronger Russia, a success in the framework of tremendous political, economic, and military defeat. From the Kremlin's point of view, not a bad move, don't you think? Visual politics community, all indications are that Belarus in one way or another may be on the verge of losing its sovereignty if it has not already lost it. The attempt to harbor the Wagners was perhaps Lukashenko's last attempt to secure more room to maneuver, but with the fall of Prigozhin, that's history now. As it stands, Belarus is likely to disappear from the map. Be that as it may, and given that we do not have a crystal ball, the best thing we can do is to open a respectful debate. Do you think that Russia will definitely annex Belarus, will turn it into a completely subordinate state, or, on the contrary, will Lukashenko and the rest of Minsk's managers be able to keep their heads? What should the West do about this whole saga? Leave us your answers in the comments below. And of course, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of us here at Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. Thanks very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.